Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another installment of Ask Epic. We meet every week to discuss all things Epic. We want to provide our new families and our returning families a place to learn about all the opportunities we offer. I'm Sarah Nunley, and I am with the Epic Development Team. Hey, everybody, and I'm Ashley Brown, and I'm also from the Epic Development Team. Excited to be here today. Um, we have a special guest with us. We'll go over that in just a second, but I always like to introduce, um, for those of you that are joining us, um, we would love to hear from you. If you have questions or comments, uh, please use the chat box for that. Um, and then if you have anything that maybe needs a little more one-on-one -on -one attention or isn't quite relevant to our topic today, we would love to, someone from our team would love to work with you privately. So I'm going to put our team's contact information in the chat right now. So you can give us a call or send us an email and um, someone from our team would love to talk with you. So I'm going to add that right now. And then, yeah, if you have any questions, we would love to see them in the chat. Thank you, Ashley. So it is hard to believe that we are already approaching the end of another school year and what a year it has been. So EPIC has seen many changes this year, new programs and lots of fun for students across the state of Oklahoma. We are so excited to step into summer break. I know everybody's looking forward to summer break for a few months off. And before we do that, we want to reflect on the school year with our Deputy Superintendent of Instruction, Justin Hunt. Justin, we are so happy you could join us today to look back on this amazing school year and maybe discuss what is to come for EPIC next year. Absolutely, happy to be here um, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. We're excited. So uh, to kind of get us started, um, one of the big changes, we made a big change this year regarding instructional time. Um, and so many of you know in the audience that students were required this year to meet with their teachers in person um, one time a week, one time per week. So Justin, could you tell us what was the motivating factor for making that decision? So, you know, there, there were a number of motivating factors. Um, we're, we, first of all, we're a firm believer um, in relationships um, and student teacher relationships and getting to know each other and just really feel like um, in order for maximum student learning, student lifelong learning to occur, um, you know, you, you see that when you have a good relationship um, with your students as a teacher. So that's, that's probably the first reason um, we try to model that um, across the entire organization, whether it be, you know, adult relationships with with, um, with amongst leaders or or um, with with all employees, and and we just felt like we needed to do the same um, with teachers and students. And not saying it didn't happen before, um, but actually make it an emphasis and and make it an expectation um, that that we want to see and. You know, I would say that that's probably the first one. The second one is every year um, when we get our state test scores back, we always we, we are compared to everybody else in the state, um, even though we are different in multiple ways. Um, and in that comparison, we really dive into um, our best practices um, and maybe some of our weaknesses. And we compare ourselves to those that um we, I don't want to say compete with, but our other traditional brick and mortar um, colleagues, if you will. And we think about what, what do they have that we don't, those that score better than us um, outside of, of, you know, students are going to be students. We're statewide. They have a specific community, but what do they provide or what are some of the best practices they are able to um, implement that maybe we don't yet? And one of the things that uh, Mr. Banfield and I thought about was seat time, if you will, um, time, instructional time, uh, individualized or in small groups uh, where a teacher is present in person uh, with the student. That's one thing that we've never really made an emphasis um, as a virtual school. Um, we see it in our blended, um, like I say, our blended, our, our learning centers that we have in the, in the Tulsa and Oklahoma City metro areas. And, and traditionally speaking, um, or I should say historically speaking, um, those performance scores are a little better than, than our virtual uh, performance scores. So we really, we thought, you know, using those two ideas, um, what would happen if we were to make it an expectation for teachers to meet with every student once a week? Um, and we did so. Uh, we, we were able to do that this year. And, and I'm really excited with the stories that have been shared with myself 
um, and many of the leadership um, teammates as well of, of, you know, successes and, and great things that have happened when teachers have been in person with their students. That's amazing. I love that feedback and the intentionality of Epic um, to recognize that need. Um, and it sounds like they did such a great job this year of meeting that need with our students. Um, but we all know that it's important for our students to have that interaction and instructional time with their teachers and to have good educational outcomes. So how does Epic try to keep the same level of student engagement in a virtual environment? Yeah, so, you know, in comparison with other um, virtual schools, I feel like we do a pretty good job of controlling our roster sizes in terms of how many students um, are assigned to each teacher. Um, and I think most most of the folks in the audience know that we we try to keep our students within about 45 miles um, of their respective teacher to the best of our ability. And it's always a little bit interesting to hire every year um, based on we, we don't know the variables of which students are coming mid-year and, and what students aren't. Uh, that's why re-enrollment is really important. Um, and we're approaching the end of re-enrollment season. So uh, for those of you that haven't re-enrolled, please re-enroll. Um, but we, we basically, we hire teachers based off of an average roster size of 28 students to one teacher. Um, and keep in mind, that's an average. Um, so your student might be on a teacher's roster with 32. Um, or your teacher might be on a, uh, or your student might be on a teacher's roster with 26, but those average to be 28. Um, so anyway, that's that's what we hire um, based off of, and uh, we've done that for three years now, um, and we feel really comfortable um, with what we see in terms of um, our data folks, our data team um, do a great job of of really dissecting everything that we claim as a best practice. Um, in terms of how the students performed at the end of the year. And one of the things that they've come up with is we have a sweet spot with roster sizes in terms of student performance. A student performs better, generally speaking, um, on a teacher's roster somewhere between 28 and 32. So that's where we want to do it. And, and Sarah, you made a pretty good point um, or observation, if you will, that it's, it's nice that we're intentional and there's usually a reason for everything we do. Um, and I can 100% testify to that. And we beat it up in multiple discussions. Um, but we, the, the things that we do, the expectations that we have, um, we don't like to say mandates, but the things that we require, both students, teachers, any employee to do, there's always a reason why. And, um, you know, I always say uh, we and I uh, classify our decisions um, in three priorities. First priority is always going to be what's best for the student. Second priority is going to be what's best for the organization. And then the third priority is going to be what's best for the adult. Um, but for, you know, students come first and that's the reason why we're here. Um, and that's the reason why we got into to the careers that we did. That's really great to hear. And I think that's probably something that um, those of us that have been involved within the organization within Epic can see, like you mentioned, that having that data to, to back up why you're making the decisions that you do. You're right. There's so much intentionality there. If you've never tuned in, this is a plug, but if you've never tuned into the board meetings every month, that's really cool. I always enjoy that part where with it, you guys talk about the data, like, okay, well, we set this up. This is what we're doing. And this is the data that's showing why. Um, there's never any decisions that are made just because somebody felt like it that day. Everything that happens at Epic is probably data driven. You know, there's a reason it happens there. And I just think that's really unique. I don't know. Um, to me, that just seems uh, really unique to Epic. And I love hearing that. So to kind of go back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago with that once a week physical meeting requirement, um, how do you believe that that's impacted our teachers and our students? And um, should families expect this requirement to continue in the coming year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, for me, I feel like um, it's impacted the organization greatly. Like I mentioned, I, I think I've received more um, student testimonials or teacher testimonials or things that have happened um, in those relationships um, with students and teachers um, in terms of lifelong learning skills uh, more this year than ever. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to say we had teachers that weren't meeting with their students. Um, but it's it's in this virtual world, um, just as we are here today, 
it's easy to do it this way. Um, it's, it's easy to, um, you know, instruct students virtually and, and just get ingrained in that. But, um, man, sitting shoulder to shoulder with a kiddo going over a math problem, uh, there's power in that. And, and there's, you know, the engagement and it just, it's exciting. So, um, you know, our average, we, we call it weekly engagement. Our average weekly engagement this year is about 70%. And in year one, that's not bad. Um, we probably had a little bit loftier goal than that. Um, but next year, we're going to shoot for 80 um, because we just we feel like um, we can do better than that. And, and now that we have um, a year under our belt of that expectations, because we know it's a, it's I don't want to say it's one more thing, but, you know, our families were in a routine maybe of doing it only virtual. So this was a change for them. And depending on the household size, it could be a huge change to try to get their student um, to a micro site or to a library or to a meeting spot um, once a week. And we completely understand that. But um, hopefully, you know, we set that as a baseline for our teachers and students. And um, just like everything else in life, uh, we can all improve and we can improve that. And so our goal for weekly engagement next year will be 80 percent. And we'll see what comes out next year. And, you know, we'll shoot for that. And and adjust it the, the following year accordingly. That's amazing. And I, I agree with you. I'm mom of three and I loved, um, you know, as my kids were growing up, that interaction with the teachers and how important that that is for your students to have that interaction. Obviously it's a virtual setting, but being able as a parent too, to interact with the teacher and, and have that interaction also helps the students. I, I absolutely love that. Um, so next year, how can, uh, or how else can students ex expect to receive improved interaction and instructional time at Epic? Yeah, so I mentioned the the increase. You know that that'll be that'll be one way. Um, another way is is um, we're going to do tutoring a little bit different. Um, you know, I, we will still have a virtual option uh, with outside vendors that that'll be available for tutoring, um, but our students. In, uh, especially in grades three through eight, uh, we've decided to implement um, our own internal interventionists, if you will, that'll basically be um, epic tutors, but interventionists. We'll have um, reading interventionists and uh, mathematics interventionists. So those of our students that need a little extra help or need remediation, um, we'll have an epic employee uh, that will meet with them virtually, just like this over a Zoom as opposed to um, with an outside vendor, maybe it was um, FEV Homework Help or Epic Targeted Instruction ETI, or maybe it was Tutor Me. Um, there will be an assigned person um, for our Epic students that will be an Epic employee um, that will be their interventionist. And we, you know, I don't wanna say we feel like we can do it better, um, but we got to a point to where what we were doing um, maybe wasn't receiving as much interaction as we felt like we should be getting or could be getting. <clears throat> and, you know, just to try to get a little bit more control over that. And maybe some people have a little bit more comfortability with an Epic employee, as opposed to someone from a, um, an outside vendor that maybe they can't see and it's just a chat screen or, or maybe they see and, and don't necessarily have a connection with. So, um, you know, there will be another person that will be um, interacting with our Epic students um, and they will be EPIC employees that uh, we're calling reading and math interventionists. And it's a huge investment. Um, but again, it's it's all based off of data that we've seen. And, um, you know, the satisfaction rate that we were seeing from some of our families and students, of uh, the tutoring options that um, we were requiring uh, weren't working. Um, so, you know, instead of beating people over the head, as I like to call it, and trying to get them to come to something they're not satisfied with, then uh, let's change it. And we're going to own it. Um, and um, we we plan to do better. And I just, I strongly encourage um, the audience that's uh, listening to this or that's that's interacting with us here today to um, engage with this interventionist and, and let's give this another shot. And again, ultimately, I mentioned the three priorities. This is what's in the best interest of the student. Um, it's difficult for a teacher to bring a student up to grade level. Um, and, you know, there is a COVID slide that all of our students um, experienced. So um, the extra remediation, the extra help that we'll be able to provide to all of our families 
um, with these interventionists um, is one way uh, that we plan to to change next year in terms of tutoring. I think that's um, like you said, you kind of you guys do such a great job of like hearing that feedback and getting responses from students and families. And um, I feel like there's probably going to be a lot of families that are like doing a cheer in the background when they hear this, because I think this is something that a lot of families have advocated for that they've wanted. I've heard it a ton. So I'm so excited to see where that leads. I think it's going to be a great asset for Epic. And it also speaks again to Epic's willingness to, um, you know, see where where there's opportunities for improvement because there always is. Epic isn't interested in just doing status quo and just keeping it going because that's what you've always done. Um, I love to see how Epic proves time and time again, no, we want to do better than this. Even if something's somewhat working, like you want to see where can we do better. And um, I don't know, I just, I truly feel like that's so unique um, in education. That's not always the way that it goes. So I'm personally very excited to hear about yeah. these interventionists. One more thing that I should add, um, these, these interventionists and in, in also in how they differ other than just being EPIC employees that are internal, is they're actually certified teachers. Um, so that was one of the requirements uh, uh, to, to apply and to be offered this position is these interventionists will be certified teachers in the areas of reading and math and in the grade levels that they'll be serving. So, the, you know, that's that's another plus to this as opposed to what our vendors were providing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And so it's just an additional layer for our students. Um, you can never complain about having too many um, too many layers of people that want to help your student get their best outcome. So that's, that's really cool to hear. Um, okay, so to kind of shift gears a little bit, um, we know that Epic has added some microsites this year. Um, I know what a microsite is, but sometimes I have families ask us, what are those buildings that I see around town that has Epic on it? I thought you guys were virtual. Can you tell us? So we, I always find myself answering that question to families on the phone. But Justin, could you tell us a little bit, what are microsites? What are they used for? And what are the, what's the vision for the future with these microsites? Yeah, so, you know, I, I would say, again, there are multiple reasons um, why we implemented this. But first and foremost, it's to give us a controlled meeting site. Um, with the meeting expectations of once a week for our students and teachers to meet. And that's, you know, first and foremost, the reason. And then the other thing is we, we have certain parameters in place, um, state statutes and laws on where we can meet with kids and where we can't um, for great reasons, um, various reasons. Um, and one of those is a building that we lease or own uh, as opposed to, you know, um, infiltrating public libraries, if you will. Now, we can still meet in public libraries, and we do still across the state. Uh, still a great option. Um, but, you know, sometimes uh, local uh, libraries were getting a little frustrated with how much, how many uh, Epic students were coming in and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, as you know, as you can imagine, traditional libraries, I, I can see that. Um, so our microsites are, are meetups, meet, meetings for um, meeting places for teachers and students. And, uh, you know, currently um, we look at our enrollment per county. OK, so we take our entire student population, um, filter it by which county our students reside in. And the goal for 2425, which is next August, is to have a micro site in all of our 40 top enrollment counties. OK, um, we will be we will be set up for that for the most part. But the you know it it takes time to acquire a lease or acquire a building, work with a municipality because we're all over the state and get it zoned and you know get it ready for for our students to you know to be safe and and to be able to learn in some of these sites. But I would think by October ish um, we would have forty sites um, in our top forty counties um, in the state of Oklahoma and in some of those. Some of those counties where we don't have micro sites that we control, we have what we call partner sites where we've partnered with um, maybe it's a church or a different nonprofit or another organization to where they have four or five rooms that maybe they don't get used. Um, and we lease those few rooms for um, places for our uh, students to meet with teachers. Um, it also coincides with um, Common Academy, which I think will come up here in a little bit. Um, and so we, we needed a place for um, the new model that we uh, implemented a couple of years ago uh, called Schoolhouse. 
And so, you know, it, it, they are popping up all over the place. Um, being here in Enid in Northwest Oklahoma, I know when this microsite popped up, my phone was blowing up on what, you know, this one's even across from the uh, Enid Public Schools Administration building. So that, you know, caused some social media issue. And it was like, you know, you know, it's just a place for our students to meet that we can control, that we can ensure safety. Um, and, you know, that, that um, our folks, we can serve them comfortably. We can serve our families and students comfortably. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really kind of just shows that school can be different, right? We do things in a different way. Um, and it's really, uh, yeah, like you said, I'm sure it does get people questioning what's going on over there. What are they doing with those buildings? Um, but it's neat. It's neat to see the way that Epic kind of just uh, improvises and finds ways to make things work. Um, okay, so let's see. So we've piloted a new program. You just mentioned it, Schoolhouse. Um, and so this current school year was a uh, I believe the first full school year of the program, like not a pilot program, like the real deal schoolhouse, maybe I might be wrong on my, my dates there, but um, it was a successful year. I will say that I get to speak to a lot of families and we had so much interest in schoolhouse and um, we've heard a lot of great feedback on that. Um, and so I know that for this next school year, we are relaunching schoolhouse with a new name. Um, so first, can you tell us, I think you might, might've said it just a moment ago, tell us what this name changes and how, how is this model going to be changing or expanding in the upcoming school year? Yeah, so Schoolhouse's name change, branding change, rebranding, whatever you say, will be Comet Academy. As you know, we are the Epic Comets, um, and it is kind of an academy-style approach to education. Um, so I'm a firm believer in starting with the why um, as much as I can. So let me, let me give you a little background of uh, why we implemented it. And it was two years ago, but two years ago is very, very small. Um, when Epic was founded, um, it, it, you know, I don't think, um, anybody ever thought that it would be as large as it is. And, um, as, as you know, um, those you've been teachers, um, teachers are teaching pre-K through 12 in our traditional one-to-one -one model, we call it, which is great for customer service. Okay. Amazing for customer service. Our families and some of you on this call um, probably prefer one to one because you have the same teacher as long as they're here and as long as you want them. Um, you might have four kids and they can all have um, Sarah Nunley or Ashley Brown as their teacher, you know, and 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 that's great for families and it's great for customer service. But it, it we've found that it may not be beneficial for priority number one, remember, which is students. Um, and student learning. So, you know, me being a um, high school certified advanced math teacher, um, I will be completely honest. I have zero business trying to educate your child on how to read or write. Um, but give me some letters and numbers and an algebra equation, and I'm going to knock it out of the park. Um, so while it served the families well, it may not have served the students well. Uh, may not. We have some folks that just completely kill it and they're superheroes and rock stars. Uh, so what we've decided to do with Comet Academy um, is not only meet in person twice a week in these micro sites all across the state. Um, that's probably the, the basic idea of it. But it's probably to, uh, we call it grade band, our teachers and students. So we have teachers that are early childhood that are pre-K through two. All they're gonna have is pre-K through second graders. Okay, then we have elementary teachers who are three through five. All they're gonna have is third through fifth graders and then six through eight and then on into high school. So we've narrowed the focus of the teacher to those students to promote priority number one being the students and lifelong learning skills. So instead of a teacher having 28 students ranging from pre-K to 12, okay, we have teachers having 28 students from pre-K to two. Okay, now I can dive deeper um, into the Oklahoma State Standards uh, with these 28 kids that, um, or plus or minus 28 kids that are on my roster in pre-K through two. So that's that's the foundation of it. Um, so again, with the meeting in person that we talked about at the beginning, um, it's twice a week. Uh, and, you know, it's it's expected. I don't think there's any discipline for not meeting twice a week. It's just an expectation and it's kind of a guarantee that we've given families um, and then having a great banded teacher um, that's in your region. So um, 
a lot of our microsites across the state of Oklahoma are majority Comet Academy meetings, but we also have our traditional one-to-one -one meetings taking place. And we have what we call co-ops happening across the state of Oklahoma um, to where they're basically, I don't want to say informal, but they're common academies that teachers have just created on their own. Um, because the, the, you know, the thing that we've learned um, really since a couple years before COVID is to change something in this organization um, of 30,000 students. You can't just flip it on a dime. I always say it's kind of like a cruise ship, right? You can't just make a U-turn in a cruise ship, right? It's going to capsize or what have you. You've got to make small adjustments and then get pointed in a different direction. So Common Academy is one of the ways that we're trying to do that. And I'm not, I'll never say one-to-one pre-K through 12 teachers will go away. I, I'm not going to say that. We have some families that prefer that. We have some teachers that still prefer that. But we really feel like the Common Academy movement um, of having teachers in their specialized grade bands um, should probably be the majority of the organization as we progress, but we can only do it small amounts at a time. So our approach this year to, to conclude on your question, I guess, um, I mentioned with the microsites, uh, top 40 enrolled counties will have a microsite. That's also our goal for Common Academy. Our goal is to be able to offer Common Academy pre-K through 10, because that's as far as it goes right now, in our top 40 enrolled counties. So you see how those two kind of mirror each other. Um, it's very well thought out. I know everything you guys do is always very well thought out. And even the fact that you, you brought up just like small pivots as you can't turn on a dime. It's just little small adjustments. But it does seem like uh, speaking to families over the past year that Common Academy has been um, a huge factor in them enrolling and, and changing models, et cetera. So it does seem to be very, very popular uh, with our families, which is, it's awesome. I love to hear the feedback and the, you know, the positive feedback that our families are giving us with that. Yeah. Um, and so why do you think that Common Academy makes such a difference in our learning outcomes? Well, I mean, you know, to be more specific, it's the, it's the in-person meetings. Um, and again, two two days out of five in a week is still flexible. It's still school being different. It's still individualized. Um, but for me, we've positioned adults to be more successful by having um, a narrowed focus in what they specialize in. I mean, you think about the traditional world of one of uh, brick and mortar, okay, of traditional schools. And again, I mentioned it in the beginning of this call. We always compare ourselves to what are they doing that we're not? Well, here we are, okay? We have grade level teachers. Teachers teach third grade. Teachers teach fourth grade, okay? And, and that's one of the ways that we differ. So we don't want to go exactly to that because, you know, we, there's some flexibility that with that that we have. So we just felt like an early childhood teacher, their comfort zone, pre-K through two, and, and not having to be aware of everything and all subjects from pre-K through 12. So narrowing the focus for the adult, which is a benefit for the student. Uh, that's that's probably the biggest reason outside of just the meeting in person uh, and actually sitting shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow with the student and getting some direct instruction. Yeah, that's exciting to hear. I actually, we have a good question from someone in the audience. They want to know, are there hopes to offer Comet Academy for 11th and 12th grade in the future? So high school is, um, it's been the one that we're watching very closely. Uh, so last year um, we had ninth grade. And then when we talked about what we we're gonna do this year by expanding the amount of enrollment that could be in place, we said, okay, well, we really don't wanna tell our ninth grade students that they can't move on to Common Academy in 10th grade. And we feel like, you know, we're doing a decent job. We just, we still, it's still early. We still need to see some data. We still need to see, you know, how things are going in terms of growth. But the idea of being specialized is different when you get into high school. And I think what the example of myself is perfect. I couldn't teach ninth grade English, math, science, social studies. I could do high school math, 
right? So it's a little bit different of an idea. So that one's going to expand slower. We're going to be more calculated. Um, and so my answer to that is it's not off the table, but the last thing we want to do is set up anybody for failure. Um, so we're, we're monitoring that very closely. And, um, you know, like I said, it's not off the table, but I don't want to say absolutely we'll have 11th and 12th. Um, it's just something that we're monitoring and currently it's pre-K through 10, but just because we're doing something different in small increments as we turn this cruise ship. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you addressed that. That's a great point. Um, so good to know. It's on the table. We will time will tell. <laughs> um, okay, so to kind of switch gears a little bit, something that I love about Epic is that Epic wants to serve students no matter where they are on their educational journey. They're coming from traditional homeschool or brick and mortar didn't work out. We have some other scenarios where maybe they're behind and they're worried they can't graduate on time. So to kind of address that, um that population of students, we've got two new programs, um, RISE and Pathways. So I'm excited to kind of talk about those. Um, I thought we'd start with RISE. So could you tell us a little bit more about RISE and what population of students that it's designed to help? Yeah, so um, RISE is a, is a program we implemented. Um, it's, it's in its first year. We're fixing to conclude our first year. And uh, Basically, you know, our, our motto is school can be different. Um, and we get students that uh, might be two years ahead of grade level, are going to graduate early, um, all the way, I mean, all kinds of students, which is, that's why we're here. That's what we're here to serve. Whoever wants to click the button, I would say walk through the door, but we don't have to walk through the door, right? Whoever wants to click the button to enroll, we're here to serve. Um, and what we've seen is we've seen a lot of students that are the opposite of two years ahead and might be two years behind. Um, so maybe they were in a uh, enrolled in a traditional brick and mortar school and, you know, for whatever reason, um, may have fallen behind, whether it be a, a life event um, or maybe, you know, a mistake that they made in terms of attendance or whatever the case may be. They're, they're not on the traditional track um, and they're under 21. Um, that's why we set up RISE. It's, it's a little bit more of a condensed approach that we are allowed to take. Uh, with students that are behind their graduation date, if you will. Um, so maybe it's a sophomore that doesn't have any credits. And as a sophomore, you should, um, you know, you should realistically have 12 to 13 credits. Um, we're, we have that program set up to where we focus on different time periods, different classes, um, to where we can still meet state requirements, but in a shorter amount of time. Um, having said that, it's not necessarily an accelerated program. Um, you have to be behind um, in, in a bad spot in order to um, to be in the RISE program because we can't condense um, everything for everyone. Um, we, we have some limitations legally with that stuff. So we decided to offer RISE. It's strictly virtual. Um, and we have teachers that, that are experts in high school curriculums, um, and as well as, you know, the, the time schedule, certain meetings, um, it's very strict in its approach to try to speed things up, to catch these students up. So, you know, the huge win would be they can graduate on time, um, but then sometimes that win may just be graduating before they turn the age of 21. Forgot to unmute myself. I was just going to say um, something that I thought we spoke to Rise, goodness, sometime in this past year. And something that they said to me that really stuck out to me was they said they have high expectations, but they also provide high support. So there's really high expectations. It's not by any means um, an easier way. It's it's a lot of work, but they really do seem to offer um, as much support as that student needs because they recognize that oftentimes these are students that are balancing full-time jobs or maybe families or whatever the case is. Um, I thought that was really special. Um, and so I actually, just to kind of, because I it was a, it's been a while since we've spoken to Rise on the webinar. So I reached out to Jeff actually just to say, hey, could you give us an update and, and tell us where you guys landed for the end of the school year? So I'd love to share this with you if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. He told me, as of, let's see, last Friday-ish, um, they had 36 official graduates this school year. So that's 36 kids that maybe weren't expecting to get to graduate. They were on the verge of aging out. Um, and so he said they have about 40 more that are looking to graduate by October 1. 
And he said they actually had one student who started off behind cohort. So he was behind his class. He was supposed to graduate in 2025, but was behind. And he's actually now caught up and to the point that he's going to graduate early. Um, so that's, I mean, again, that's just a testament to how hard these kids are willing to work when they're given the program and the resources to do it. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm very proud of the RISE program and, and everything they've been able to do for our students that uh, that need that. I love that. Um, I, I mentioned I'm mom of three. I've got three going into college this year. So as a mom in that that age group, um, I love that age group. I love the rise and the pathway kids. I love talking to them. Um, helped many of them this past year, just just walking them through, uh, you know, the rise and the pathways programs. But they're so phenomenal, and there isn't another program in the state of Oklahoma that is reaching out to this this group of kids that really needs to be reached. Um, you know, maybe they feel like they're never going to graduate. So this is giving them hope, which is phenomenal. Um, and so you kind of touched on another new program was the Pathways program. And again, Epic saw a need for this and, and did something about it. So can you tell us a little bit more about the Pathways program? Yeah, so... Um... Historically speaking, currently, um, the state of Oklahoma doesn't really have an avenue for students that age out, which we talked about in RISE. Um, Oklahoma schools can only receive funding to educate students that are um, 21 or less years of age. Um, and so you have students that are young adults that, um, you know, have had, like I mentioned earlier, major life events happen that cause them to have to discontinue schooling for whatever reason. And again, may maybe it was they weren't mature enough to go, or maybe it was because they had a death in the family, or maybe it was because of some other thing that was completely out of their control. Um, you know, we're all humans. Um, the state of Oklahoma didn't have an avenue for those students to do anything other than receive a GED. Um, so, um, and I, you know, I, I can't claim any of this. Uh, Mr. Banfield was sitting with me at lunch one day and he said, what if, what if we found a way to educate young adults, um, that didn't, that didn't receive a high school diploma, um, and we don't give them a GED, we give them a high school diploma. And then my mind is like, well, we can't, we've always been told we can't, they age out. And he said, but what if we could? He just kept coming back. I'm like, well, you know, then we probably change the lives of thousands of Oklahomans. But I don't know if we can, Mr. Banfield. Um, and so our legal team went to war um, and, and found um, avenues with the State Department of Education to where we could. But we had to do it without state funding. We couldn't use state taxpayer money to educate anyone over 21. Um, and we found a way to do it. Uh, we found a way to fund it without using state taxpayer money um, to 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 educate these young adults from the ages of 21 to 25 um, in an effort to give them a high school diploma as opposed to a GED, um, which is life changing. You know, these these are folks that um, have families uh, that have jobs. And so for the last couple of years, um, we've had a team in place. Um, to do just that, to be mentors to these students, to guide them through this curriculum, um, and to also be, I don't want to say recruiters, but be messengers about the fact that we can, and you can, and we will. Um, and I don't have the number in front of me, but um, they, they have tons of graduates this year. Um, it was also a way that, that um, we could educate um the Afghan refugees when they came to, to Oklahoma for a safe place during during that whole thing. So we saw a need um, and we're serving it and um, couldn't be more proud of, uh, of the employees and adults that uh, we have in place to guide these young adults um, that, that needed this and found a way to serve it. And, and again, uh, Mr. Banfield uh, is, a, is a huge innovator. Um, he's a servant leader. I've never, never experienced 
any more of a servant leader than him. Um, and then our legal team just kind of follows his lead with, we're going to find a way to do it if we can. And we found it and we did. And, and we've changed a number of lives just in the course of the last couple of years. That's really encouraging to hear. I mean, just to see, like you said, there was a need that there no, but there was nothing like this in the state and you guys made it happen. And uh, really, I applaud everyone involved with that because that's amazing. So and I know we've had a lot of interest in that. I know we've um, we fielded a lot of calls from potential students that wanted to to join Pathways. And so um, I would love if you could talk to us about maybe what changes we can expect next year for Pathways, because I hear you've got maybe an exciting one for us. Yeah. So everybody listening on, these, on this call, are the, the um, external perception of this school is drastically different than it was three and four years ago. And and this next thing is probably just one example of, of how or why, um, you know, we mentioned pathways and we mentioned that we, we funded ourselves. Um, we visited with, with some legislators and, and they saw what we were doing and, and they saw the, um, you know, just the passion within us to be able to do this for, for the state of Oklahoma. Um, so recently there was a bill passed um, to where schools can receive funding to educate young adults slash students uh, for ages 21 to 25 that have had a traumatic event that made it impossible for them to continue schooling uh, when they were of age. And so now there's a process for those young adult students to raise their hand to fill out an application um, to the school. It has to be approved by the by the local school board or the governance board. And, and uh, so um, beginning next year, next school year, we will have funding available for young adults, the ages of 21 to 25 in order to educate them. Um, and our board will go through the process of approving and denying um, those applications. But again, they share our heart. Um, and if there's a will, there's a way. Um, and if, if we can legally say, yes, I can guarantee you that we will. Um, and we will hopefully change the lives of those young adults um, that didn't think they had light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and just extremely excited. You know, that it, one of the, we don't know what the number is going to be. Um, you know, our pathways enrollment previously was only around 100. Maybe it was up to 115 because we had to fund it on our own. Um, and we can only do that with a certain um, amount of money. But now that the state is going to fund those students, you know, we're built to do this. We're structured to do this virtually. Um, and it will be virtual only uh, for various reasons. Again, um, you know, these students have full-time jobs more than likely, probably have multiple people in their family and will need to work at times that are different than our traditional students. Um, and then there's the comfortability of the majority of the folks that we serve and, and thinking about 21 to 25 students, you know, sitting shoulder to shoulder with an elementary student. We get that. Um, so this will be a virtual only program that we will provide um, and we're excited and um, it'll look a little bit different than it did this previous year, just because the volume of people that we might be approached with to serve. We don't know what that's going to look like, but we know the potential could be in the thousands just based off of consensus data and, and things of that nature. So um, we're excited to be able to serve these folks. We're excited to to hopefully work hand in hand with them and, and change their lives as well as their families' lives. That's exciting news. So I, I love that. Um, hopefully we get an influx of students in that, that age group that, like you said, we can give them hope. Um, you know, because a lot of students, GEDs are great, don't get me wrong, but they would love that diploma. And speaking to them, the fact that they were able to attend this year really, really uh, boosted their self-confidence as well. And I, it's, it's just such a great, great program. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for discussing that with us. So this school year was year four for EPIC's uh, very own curriculum. Can you talk more about our curriculum? Yeah. So, um, gosh, four years ago, I guess, uh, lose track of time because it never, every year never ends. They all just kind of go together, but, um, Trusting the four years ago, we we decided to create our own curriculum uh, called Epic Ed. You know, we have multiple, again, we have multiple extin, exterior, external vendors, um, if you will, that we generally receive curriculum from. 
whether it be Edmentum, Plato, um, Apex, um, Bright Thinker, whatever the case may be. Um, and none of them are 100% aligned to the Oklahoma State standards. Um, some are more aligned than others. And so what, what I mean by that, uh, for those uh, on the audience that, that may not understand, is there may be some things that your student is required to be taught and tested on in the state of Oklahoma at the end of the year that the curriculum that you're purchasing through the Learning Fund doesn't even cover, um, doesn't even expose your child to. Um, and that was a huge miss. You know, we're Oklahoma's different in many ways. Um, and one of the things we don't do is we don't align ourselves to national standards. We have our own set of Oklahoma state standards and uh, some of the curriculum vendors, um, you know, they we're the only, we're, we are one of the few virtual schools. And so that there's just not a very big market is probably the best way to say that. Um, so we decided to do it ourselves. And um, there was a team that did it four years ago. Um, and and started the foundation and the building blocks and um, you know we're now in year four we've we've gone pre-k through all the way up to high school um, I think at the end of this year we'll be done with high school we just have to add some electives that's one of the see high, I mentioned with Common Academy high school is different than pre-k through eight so if we're going to create a epic ed epic owned curriculum for high school we got to think about those electives that are that are required in the state of Oklahoma whether it be uh, computer science or uh, you know all, all the electives that are required on top of the core um, the core English math and science and history um, so that's been the biggest hurdle I would say with high school and every year we've refined it um, you know we, when we originally created it um, we created it in a way that we wanted to utilize resources that we've already paid for. So it might be embedded with IXL lessons. It might be embedded with, you know, whatever whatever the resource we were already paying for. And, and that worked for two or three years. Um, but now we're even revolving it um, a little bit more to be our own creation. So not utilizing any resource that we pay for that would, you know, require a license or, or whatever the case may be. It is simply Epic owned, Epic created, uh, or it will be. That's that's currently what they're working on. Um, so, you know, there, there's positive and negatives to that. Um, you know, we have a team of, of, you know, nine to 12 folks that are working long hours a day, creating, refining, editing, um, fixing mistakes. Um, and so you think about that compared to a company like, uh, Edmentum or Apex, that's a billion dollar company. Uh, they can do a lot more quicker uh, than we can, but really feel like it's it's on the right track. Um, not perfect, but really, really close and closer than, than it was last year. And it'll be closer next year. And every year is going to be um, just a little bit better. And so we're excited about Epic Ed. Um, we offer it free to those students that are in the grade levels that it can serve. And so that allows a little bit more money in the learning fund for our families to choose to, to spend on something else. Uh, if you don't have to buy a curriculum, well, curriculums are pretty pricey. Uh, you could get Epic Ed and, and use that amount for something else, whether it be supplies or driver's ed or, or whatever the case may be that, uh, that we have to offer or that our vendors have to offer. So uh, really excited about Epic Ed. The other thing that I'll mention, um, the other thing that's being refined is an Epic Ed workbook. Okay. Uh, we have Epic Ed workbooks, which is a little bit weird because you're a virtual school, right? Well, there's still a place for hands-on learning. You can't learn handwriting on a computer screen. I mean, you probably can better now than you could three years ago. Um, I mean, I have a pen here that'll write on my screen, but for a child that's learning how to write, it probably needs to be on a paper. Uh, so we've implemented Epic workbooks that we sent to all of our Epic Ed students um, this, this previous year, but next year, we're going to send an Epic Ed workbook to every student, um, even if they do not choose Epic Ed, because it's 100% aligned to Oklahoma State standards. And also, we live in a world of technology, which is fantastic. But some days, it doesn't want to work for us. Um, or maybe our internet's down, or maybe we haven't received it yet. We had to send it back because it got broken. We haven't received the other one yet. Each student will have, um, each student in the grades that Epic Ed can serve, We'll have an Epic Ed workbook 
um, that they could use for extra practice or they could use for those days that they need to, um, that they don't have technology. That is super exciting news. Um, and I have no doubt that our families and caregivers are going to be super excited about that because that is one of the questions that we do field is, you know, is Epic sometimes offline and, you know, parents want that for their students' handwriting, et cetera. So that is, um, that's amazing. Epic is so innovative in their thought processes. And um, I know our families really appreciate all the work that you guys put into to that uh, curriculum, especially. Um, so we have one last question for you. As the school year is coming to a close, can you tell us your thoughts on Epic's progress this school year? And has anything got you excited for the future? <laughs> Well, I'm always excited about the future, um, you know, just looking forward and, and knowing, you know, some of the changes that I've just discussed today and, and how um, beneficial they could be to the students we serve and, and the lifelong learning of the students we serve. Um, I think for me, um, you know, the progress has been ongoing and every, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, just, just please know that everything we do is for a reason. Um, and, you know, while it may seem like one more thing, it's, I guarantee you, it's one more thing that's in the best interest of your student because that's how we operate. Um, so whether it be meeting expectations that just feels like another hurdle you have to jump through in this busy thing we call life, um, it's in the best interest of your student, whether it be bell ringers. Okay. That's one thing we didn't cross on this, on this path of Vasque Epic, but, you know, bell ringers are something that, that we, put in place in order to um, take attendance this way the State Department makes us take attendance. Um, they try to fit us in a brick and mortar box and it doesn't really work, but bell ringers is a solution that we came up with that is not very time consuming for the student, but is beneficial for the organization in order to check the box that we're required to check to be open to serve your students and to the best of our abilities. Um, so, you know, I, I could, any issue that comes up, um, you know, there, there's a, there's a reason and, um, it's generally in the best interest of the student or the organization and the organization has to be here, um, in order for us to, to have school that can be different. So, um, you know, we, we greatly appreciate the trust, um, that our families that we serve has in us. Um, you know, we, we couldn't be who we are without our families and without our teachers, our teachers are some of the hardest working individuals in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll guarantee that. Uh, so I'm excited about where we're going because of all the changes we've been able to put in place and the stability that we have currently in the organization that maybe we haven't had in previous years. Um, and I'm just excited about the direction we're going um, and, and knowing that everything we do is based on a servant's heart uh, we're all servant leaders and, and, you know, we're just trying to do everything to the best of our ability. Um, and we completely understand that uh, our families have a choice. They've chose to come here. Nobody's requiring it and we appreciate them for doing so. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, it has been really great. I know that you said earlier on, you love to be able to share the why behind things. And I know for myself, um, that was really great to hear the why behind so many of these great things that Epic is doing right now. And so if this doesn't have you excited for the next school year and the next five years for Epic, I don't know what will, but I think that this is a great way to kind of close out, um, close out uh, our webinars for this school year. Um, thank you, Justin, Thanks. for joining us. I know that you're so busy right now and um, we really appreciate you taking the time to kind of give us a little peek into the behind the scenes of things. Um, so yeah, so just like I said a moment ago, we are going to be taking a little break for summer. Let you guys enjoy your summer break. Go out there and go to the pool mm -hmm. and go outside and go to the library and do awesome stuff for us. And we will be here um, in August before school starts back. We'll be ready to jump right in and kind of give some updates on all things Epic because I can guarantee you that there will be something mm -hmm. new or different within in two months. Oh, so, totally. you know, just hang out for about uh, two two days and we're going to have something new and exciting to share with you. So um, I know that I and Sarah and Shawnee and Carla, we've really loved getting to share all of these things with you and meet so many incredible people and learn the why behind so much of what Epic does. And we really can't wait to see what the future holds when we come back for next school year. 
So I just want to say, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. No, you're fine. I was going to back you up there and say it's been so exciting. And I know that our families and caregivers appreciate it so much, finding out the why, as you put it, um, and all of the backing that Epic gives to all of these programs. It's just been, it's been phenomenal every single week um, to get to, to know everybody. Um, so I do want to throw out there, if you guys have any questions about any of these programs, anything that Justin brought up, um, please feel free to contact our department and we can discuss that with you. We can discuss enrollment with you. Um, we are happy to discuss anything with you that you that you have questions about. Uh, feel free to reach out to our department. Our information's in the chat. And um, we are so glad to have you, Justin. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah, so I appreciate the invitation. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to be able to speak and and thank you ladies for for everything you do to facilitate this for for our families and and those that we serve and and to better um, inform them and allow them the opportunity to ask questions. Um, this you guys do a great job and and I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. I hope everybody has a great summer and we will talk to you soon. Bye bye.